Hey, what's up, amigos? It's the Prodigy Maker Show going live for episode number 30. It's Chris Lewitt here, and it's our final show before the holiday times, and I wanted to wish everyone a happy holiday, uh, Merry Christmas and the like, and I'm excited to have our last show of the year of 2019 and then we'll do a whole other series coming up in 2020. But tonight I wanted to talk about the forehand, how I like to build it, what I see as problematic in junior development, especially for young kids, how most young kids are taught the forehand around the world, and I have some other interesting topics related to this. Uh, I'd like to maybe touch on some of the forehands that I see on the Pro Tour, and also got some good uh, messages in our grab bag. In our, our, I've got a lot of emails this week that we could talk about, questions from parents uh, around the world, so we can try to get to the mailbox segment later. But let's sort of dive into the forehand and what I, what I see and how I like to build it. But number one issue that I see with young kids, and I'm thinking now under 10, with the forehand is the forehands look pretty stiff to me and so I'm in New York and a lot of the kids that I see are from the New York area, the Northeast United States but I also have kids who come to me from all over for my summer camp so I get a glimpse of players from around the entire country and a little bit internationally. I do visit Europe a lot so I see forehand development in Europe as well so I think I have a pretty good perspective. I'm also a big consumer of online video and social media so I get to see forehand development all across the world through the internet and through social media and I do receive a lot of video from parents around the world so I, I feel I'm getting a good amount of info from from different sources all around the world to start making some observations about the way the forehand is taught. And basically what I see is a very stiff model of forehand. I see a forehand that is generally taught in a traditional way and I want to I talk about what traditional means. Let, let's dig into that. And I want to I promote or offer a model of forehand development that's new and a little different the way I like to do it and you know some of you will say oh that's crazy to develop the four in that way and and others maybe you'll have an open mind and say hey why not why can't we think a little bit outside of the box in the way we train the four and so that's usually the the divide that I see between coaches when I start talking about the four in this way uh, that on one half uh, on one half you have on you have a dividing line and on one half you have coaches who say well we need to teach the fundamentals and then on the other half you have coaches who are more forward thinking and they're willing to sort of evolve how they teach the forehand. So a uh, good question right away is what are the fundamentals because fundamentals are, are within the eye, they're in the eye of the beholder, right? So fundamentals. What I see as traditional is typically the forehand for young kids is taught you know, turn, take the racket back, follow through low to high, swing low to high and follow through to the ear, follow through to the top of the shoulder, catch the racket out in front, catch the racket uh, above the shoulder, on top of the shoulder by the ear, transfer the weight, shift from back to front, swing forward and up, uh, with a firm wrist, mm, these are sort of the, the basics. Did I miss any? Stay on the ground, you know, stay grounded. So basic, uh, basically turn sideways, rack it back, swing low to high, transfer, shift from back leg to front, back foot to front, follow through up very high, usually around the neck or catch it out in front. And that is the forehand from a long time ago, it's not, I don't know how long ago, how far it goes back, but in my lifetime, it's about, I don't, 
I'm getting I'm getting kind of oh, I'm going to date myself here, but but this is getting back to the 70s and 80s when I was born. Right? This is like the beginning when I was a little baby and I growing up as a child. Everybody pretty much hit the foreign like that, except very rare exceptions like Bjorn Borg, who was a genius, and he he de- basically force, foreshadowed the future modern forehand, right? So most people hit the forehand that way, and almost every coach in the world taught the forehand that way, and Bjorn Borg has amazing stories about how he broke the mold. He refused to listen to all the coaches of his time, uh, maybe going back to when he was a kid in the 60s. He refused to listen to any of the coaches, the best coaches in the world, who told him that he had to you know, step in, hit with a firm wrist, follow through high to the ear, blah, blah, blah. You know the drill. Guys, you know what I'm talking about. It's, it's the forehand from the 60s, 70s, 80s playbook. Every, everyone should know what I'm talking about, anyone who's in tennis, because this is the forehand that's predominantly taught to little kids. I don't care what age you're talking about, three, four, five, six, eight, Ten. Usually, this is the foreign that's taught to little kids. And the year is 2019, about to turn 2020. Guys, I appreciate all your waves. Thank you for tuning into the program. I really appreciate your support. And I'm especially grateful during this holiday season for all of the friends and the fans of this program. Thank you, guys. I'm seeing all your waves and thumbs up, and I really appreciate it. Thank you for tuning in. This is just, this is a mom and pop program. It's just the pop, but this is basically me. Uh, I like to rap, you know, talk about tennis, high performance tennis, tell you my stories from the junior development trenches. And I think those of you who are fans of the show and the show audience has been growing steadily. I know that you appreciate that I keep it real and that I share honest insight and I don't try to sugarcoat a lot of things. And also I try to look into the future and try to talk about junior tennis and junior tech especially technique development with a forward uh with my eyes focused on what's the the, what are the coming trends and that's the the technical models that i like to try to build so when i see the forehand being taught to little kids and then i get those kids i i see them i see them at at whether they come to me at eight or nine or ten or they come to me at eleven or twelve I'm seeing all of these children with basically a forehand from 1960s. You know, it's an antediluvian forehand. It's a it's a uh, an outdated forehand. It's an old school forehand, and I gotta fix all these forehands. So this is fantastic for my business. In fact, I probably shouldn't do this podcast or show at all because then the more the word gets out, the better the coaching will be hypothetically theoretically people actually you know people actually use my ideas on the court i know a lot of you do so maybe i should shut up and turn the phone off here but i don't care i'm going to say it the way i i want to say it and i want to help a lot more children out there but probably from a business point of view i should shut my mouth right now because i know that these kids are being taught in an old fashioned way and people bring their kids to me to modernize them and get them on track to be a world-class player or a top college player. They want their kids to have the goods, you know, the goods that you see on TV. So I get, I, I'm building that. I'm getting paid a lot of money to build those players that way. And it's just remarkable to me that the textbook for little kids between whatever age, from from beginning to 10 years old, let's say, I'm just using that as an example, like U10, the the playbook for teaching the four, we're just keeping this show on the four, and it's a big four end show, we could talk about all the strokes, because I'd love to get into the serve and back end too, the, you know, the big three, serve, four and back end, and we can, if you guys have questions about it, go right ahead, I see we already got a couple questions on the board already, I'll, I'll get to those in a minute guys, thank you for the questions, but Let's just try to focus on one area, the forehand. So these little tigers are getting taught traditional stuff, stuff that you would think 
would, would have been a, a, debunked by now, like like mythical, the mythical old school form that would have been debunked by now. Like it should have been discarded by now because you just don't see it on the tour and it still exists. It's still, I don't know how it, it won't die. The old school form won't die yet. And in fact, we even see traces of it on the pro tour now i'd like to talk about that specifically with the foreign of dominic team i would say his practice for him not even his match for him, his practice for him which is totally weird that he has like a practice old school forehand and then he transforms it into a a modern whippy thing when he plays it's it's messing with my mind guys and if, if if you guys are familiar with Dominic Team's foreign like let's talk about it because it's it's freaking me out a little bit and I need to go maybe to therapy about it maybe this this was this would be a, a, a proper venue where I could you guys could help me talk through some talk therapy about Dominic Team's foreign because there's a bifurcation there there's a, a split personality in his foreign that is is messing with me right now. So I love to talk about that. We could talk about another guy who's a little bit old school is Sitsipas. To me, and I love I love these guys. These guys are great players, so don't you know don't don't hate me for saying stuff like this. But basically there's another guy, Sitsipas, pretty classic. To me he's got this is kind of funny. I think it's funny. He's got the strokes of a 1980s Division I college player. But yet, he's a world-class athlete. He's probably going to be one of the next Grand Slam winners of the, of the next-gen players because he's, he's a great, amazing you know, battle, battler, amazing fighter. But to me, he's got the strokes of a 1980s Division I college player, and he's out there on tour in the, on, in the modern game doing quite well. Maybe I'm being overly harsh. You got team with the continental grip backhand doesn't make any sense. It's bizarre. It's crazy. And then he's got this forehand that in practice, he's catching it up high and out in front like it was 1965. And then when he starts playing, he whips that thing like Nadal. Weird. Very weird. And, this, and I want to get into why, because I have a theory why he does it like that. But it's crazy. And now you got... You're going to get all the coaches who are teaching the old school way justifying the way they teach because of team. Or, and justifying the way they teach, uh, maybe watching Tsitsipas or who's the other old school guy? I Man, a dude slips my name. The big guy, you know, the 6'6 six, six guy. Uh, you guys know what I'm talking about. The guy with the follow through wrapped around his neck. Yeah. Sorry, it's getting late here, guys. This show almost didn't happen because my baby wouldn't go to sleep. Baby Ocean was up, so I, I'm just happy that we got the show on. I was like, it's Christmas, almost Christmas, holiday time. I got to get the show up. If I don't get it up now, the holidays are going to hit, and there's just no way the show is going to hit. But I heard that podcasts and shows don't get any audience during the holidays. I was surprised by that because I think we've been getting good traffic and good participation from our audiences, but... I, I heard from some other podcast producers that they don't get uh, uh, much audience or traffic during the holidays, so they don't even they don't publish that much during holidays. But I mean, we're going to do this last show, and then we'll see you guys in 2020. Anyway, let me try to get to a few questions. I know you guys probably have a lot of questions about the forehand, the modern forehand, how to build it. How, you know, ask me anything. How, ask me how I like to build it. I'm going to get into it more. I mean, this is going to take all night. Uh, ask me about Dominic Team's forehand. What's the other dude? It's slipping my mind right now. Guys, help me out here. The, the big guy, 6'6", six, six, the Russian dude. Uh, Medvedev, Medvedev. Sorry, okay, I got it. Medvedev's forehand. Oh, my God, what a travesty that forehand is. I've talked about it many times. This is maybe the ugliest forehand ever. And yet... He can whip it in a modern way. You see these strange hybrid forms now. Team, Medvedev, Tsitsipas with the 1980s Division I style. It's weird. Like You have like a, a backlash against the modern forehand. And then you've then you got guys coming up like Kyrgios and Berrettini. And, and they, they've got the flavor. They, they've got the flavor that I like. 
So maybe you guys can visualize where I'm coming from if you know these players, the way I like to build it. All right, first question of the night. I think I might have missed the question. Kyle Williams says, I like using the Zumzer as a model for him. Dude, you sent me Zumzer's... You, talk, you, you messaged me about this, Kyle, and, and I'm with you. His foreign looked pretty good. I looked it up, actually, because I, I didn't have a good picture of it in my mind, and I thought it looked pretty fluid and elastic, and I liked it. So let me know if, if uh, you, you agree. Sounds like you like to use it as the model, but is it as good as, I don't know, Kyrgios or Berrettini or... I don't know. I like uh, I like a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of the some of the next gen guys coming up. I, I like their forens. I like who else do I like? I like I like the Federer model. I like I like Rafa. I like Rafa's foreign a lot. I'll be honest. I want to talk about Rafa's foreign because I would like to touch on the reverse finish tonight too. If we can talk about the is this is a misnomer? The reverse finish is multiple reverse finishes. So I'd like to get into that as well with you guys. We could talk about the reverse finish, finishes, the, the different options. Because what I've been noticing on tours is a lot of different reverse finishes now, and I also believe we should teach those to young children. Maybe not the youngest, but as they definitely as they get older, through eight through twelve years old, we should definitely be teaching those variations to the kids. Maybe not initially, but I, and I want to talk about what those variations are because they're really interesting. The technical evolution that's happening on the foreign right now on the modern, uh, on the tour, on the pro tour level. For example, just looking at team, team is is reversing a lot now, like Nadal. Very interesting way that he's reversing the the forehand finish. I'd like to talk about it more. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but his forehand, he's whipping it through a lot and finishing up over. Uh, around his head with the lasso finish, the buggy whip lasso. lasso there's different. There's different ways that he, that they do it. I want to get into the differences, but it's it's interesting. Very interesting for me. I was watching Team, I think, uh, just last month when he beat Medvedev. Was it the ATP Finals or I forget which tour? I think it was ATP Finals or anyway. He so team was starting to whip the foreign like Nadal and I, and I said man it looks almost identical to N- Nadal is Nadal's reverse and I wonder if he copied Nadal or he's been experimenting with it and so you see this very interesting style uh, st- stylistic trend technical trend player uh, take team for example maybe destined to win the French Open where he's in practice following through with a catch a high catch that you never see anymore. Like very rarely see. Only guys warming up do that. And then when they play, they never do it. And that's what he does. And then when he plays, he's whipping it through and reversing like Nadal. Very interesting technical developments at the top level. Because these are the next-gen guys that all of the coaches are studying and that all of the kids are going to start copying. So it filters down to the young junior kids coming up. Okay, sorry for rambling on. Brian Bleem is never going to forgive me. Brian's a big fan of the show. Thank you for tuning in, amigo. Brian says, Chris, question about grip size. I know the standard, usual way of determining grip size, but is there an advantage for using a smaller grip size? Yes, I definitely think you should use smaller, and I advise that to all my players. My understanding is that a lot of the players on tour are going smaller in terms, in terms of thinner, and I think it helps you whip the racket better. So that is the quick answer to maybe a more complex question. But the answer is yes, I would try to go smaller. In the old days, again, this is a a good contrast to the old days where you try to go with a big, thick grip. You know, you get a big, heavy racket, like 14, 15 ounce deal and a four and a half grip. And and you just slug that thing flat. And I think that the future is clearly smaller, thinner grip lighter racket, better high-tech materials where you can whip that thing and create a lot of violent force uh, with the racket. So that's my take on that. Guys, if you have any further questions on that or further questions on the foreign, don't be shy. I know a lot of you like to tune in and enjoy silently. And you know what? You're always welcome on this show. No problem. If you're brave enough to 
wave and ask a question, just let me know. No problem. I'm going to keep wrapping on. I see my buddy Robert Garrett is waving. What's up, Robert? Robert has a very good podcast, Payers and Players. The most aptly, the best name for a tennis podcast on junior development, I think, uh, on Apple Apple uh, podcast. Payers and Players, check it out. Come on now. That's a great show. All right, so getting back to this, just starting with U10, I just can't believe what we teach young kids. It's boggling my mind. It blows me away. It, it's incredible how... How, the, how human beings work. Human beings are creatures of habit. We, we Coaches, we coaches, us coaches, cannot get away from our, our habits. Our habits are the way we were taught, oftentimes the way we, we play, the way we were taught, right? And most people were taught that old style, the style that I mentioned previously. And... What's happened now is coaches are justifying teaching a very outdated style and I would argue an inefficient technique by saying it's the fundamentals. You know, well, we got to teach the fundamentals first. I know many famous coaches who did, including Tony Nadal, including uh, many guys who I've I've studied with. Luis Bruguera, uh, I'm just throwing out, out some Spanish names, famous Spanish coaches. Who else? Pato Alvarez. American coaches, I don't know, not, not Macy so much. Macy, I think, is with me on this a little more. You know, I, I think Macy's with me, man. Macy, he's on the cutting edge down there. I'm with Macy. I'm, Macy and I are standing on the edge, on the precipice. I mean, we're doing it. He, he doesn't, he doesn't, Macy doesn't give a shit. He'll teach, he'll teach anything to any little kid, you know, like good stuff good modern stuff because he doesn't want to teach things twice. Guy's smart, right? Very smart coach. So he doesn't want to teach things two times. He doesn't want to build two motor programs and and have to, you know, get up, have to stack them on top of each other or replace one with another. He's going to build one motor engram, one motor program. And what he likes to do is get it looking real modern at a very young age. I respect Macy for that. I respect Macy a lot. So what I mean by like more modern for little kids, let's just talk about that. The contrast, the juxtaposition here. That would be fluidity, elasticity, looseness in the arm, parabolic swing shape, which is a circular swing shape. More a combination of open and semi-open stances along with, you still teach a closed or neutral stance, but you teach a a variety of stances, but I like to focus on semi-open and open, loading and and exploding, getting off the ground a little bit, using the legs to lift off the ground, creating rotation in the body. You know, like the the idea of angular momentum, not, not just the linear style, but getting a good rotation in the hips and shoulders, and... Wind, like a windshield wiper with the arm, and then a multitude of finishes, but especially the finishes that are inverted, which is, which are, which is when the racket is lower than the hand at the end, and, and low, low finishes, particularly low finishes with a drift. I call it a drift, where the racket is, is just hanging or dangling or flowing downward. It's not being held tight and upright. And these are sort of some of the things that I... I when, I, when, when I'm comparing, for lack of a better way to describe it, traditional versus modern, whatever you want to call it, guys, just it, you got to classify it some way. Uh, in my method, this is what I teach, and these are the, the words that I use, the language that I use for my method of teaching the foreign. So just to give you a glimpse of what I'm doing, and I try to promote what I'm doing all the time. I'm posting videos. I try to stir some debate. Uh, online, I post to many many Facebook groups, and and I publish a lot. I publish articles for magazines, and I have a blog at prodigymaker.com. You can go to the blog and read all about this stuff. And I post lots of videos there, and you know I'm all over social media trying to you know stir the pot a little bit and make some coaches think. And most of the coaches are very defensive, and they want to adhere to their 
old school model model of, of teaching. They don't want to. Um, they don't have the open mind that they could be able to teach the foreign in a more efficient way, a better way, faster way to get to world class. And you can still develop very good players the old, the, the traditional way. You can start with the fundamentals, quote unquote, that are sort of the old school fundamentals, and then you can transition players slowly to a more modern swing as they get older. And many, many great coaches operate that way, and it works. It, it, it works, so I, I can't say that's totally wrong, but I, I can say that I don't think it's the most efficient pathway to get from A to B, to get from, or A to Z, to get to world class. I think it's much faster to get to a world class foreign if you start with some of the look and the style and the technique that you, that you see uh, most, most next gen players, Dominic Team and Medvedev and Tsitsipas aside. Aside from you know a, a small cluster of players, most of the next gen up and coming players, they they you you teach the little kids like that, and then it's much faster. The development for them is much faster because they have the motor program that they need, and they just have to make a few adjustments as they get older. Like maybe usually the back swings are a little big for young kids, and I think that's okay. So the back swing is not typically in the slot. That's one 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 place where I disagree with Macy. Macy's all about getting the back swing in the slot for a little, you know, five year old, seven year old. I think that's crazy. Most of the time, you know, the the back swing can be big for little kids, and you, that you, you so you have little adjustments that you do over time. But you you basically have the shape and the form and the technique and the, especially the fluidity. Fluidity is huge for the little ones. A fluid, elastic swing, and you try to get that. At any age, four, five, six, seven, eight, you get that beautiful, and then you have much less work to do at ten, eleven, or twelve. And and I'm putting myself out of a job here, or at least I'm hurting my own business here. Because if if they if everyone starts teaching little kids like that, I guess I'll move on to the next thing. I'll find the next the next generation trend on the tour you know these reverse finishes are fascinating to me the way the foreign is being reversed now the different variations of reverse i think this is a technical area that really interests me in terms of evolution and the way the game is changing because it's not just the old buggy whip where you come up around your head on a low ball or a ball out wide when you're late there's something different going on here where guys are reversing and girls are reversing even on a ball that they're not late they're, they're not that late on. They could do a traditional follow-through, and they're choosing to go up and around their head like a lasso. And on one hand, I'm confounded by this. I'm confused, and I'm fascinated, and I'm intrigued. I want to I study every reverse foreign on the planet right now and, and just observe the different variations. There's also a variation where the hand comes up and the palm, the palm goes up, there's like Rafa style, like a lasso, where he finishes with his bicep close to his ear. You have uh, different variations on the reverse, where some guys are real flexible and they 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 come down along their back. Some guys finish up top. There's the hook finish. There's a number of different finishes and variations, probably based on physiology and the player's flexibility and ROM range of motion. But there's also something else going on with, with choices that these players are making. It started with Rafa. So let me just get into this real quick because I find this really interesting. And then I know there are a, a, a bunch of comments and questions. I'll, I'll get to you guys. I'm sorry. But with the reverse, and I, I just want to dig into this a little bit, the reverse foreign. Basically, Rafa came along and started doing a new type of reverse. Maybe in the, I don't know, late mid 90s late 90s 2000s he started doing a reverse that no one had ever seen before not even with borg back in the day and it's the type of reverse where rafa would extend through the ball so he would accompany the ball really well go through and up and then he'd come back around his head and lasso the racket and he started doing it a lot it probably really freaked uncle tony out because uncle tony is a big to the ear, follow through, traditional dude. You know, he calls it calligraphy. You got to get the calligraphy of the foreign right uh, before you can learn, I guess, to, to your, own, your own writing style. 
Anyway, he's very strict about that with, with kids, so it must have really freaked him out when Rafa started doing this weird, new, not, you know, this, this novel uh, lasso-style reverse. You know, it's not a, bug, not, not a buggy whip where you're coming straight up. It's, it's a lasso. He goes forward and then back around, and I guess I can link to this in the show notes. I'll link a few videos for you guys if you have no clue what I'm talking about. Hopefully, a lot of you guys are in tennis and you, you know what I'm saying here. I, was, I have my racket. If you want me to demo what I'm talking about, let me know if you're watching the show live. But I'm trying not to do too many demos because it doesn't, it doesn't help the podcast audience. And I think our biggest audience is on the podcast. So anyway... So he, he's, Rafa started this style, and no one knew what, what the hell it was. Everyone's freaking out. All the commentators are like, what is that? And it looked kind of weird, uh, maybe a little ugly. And, you know, if you look at it in high-speed video, he's actually extending through the ball. So he's, he's not technically late. I mean, he might be fractionally late, but he's not late, late. And... I want to know why he started doing that. Was it like a personal feeling he had? Or, he's, or he feels that you can't really see it on video. It doesn't look late on video, but he feels it's fractionally late. So he, he feels he needs to like reverse it up after he extends through it, even though it, it's not really late. I'm wondering if it's, it's because it's fractionally late, very, very just a tiny bit late that he, he feels it, he senses it, and his instinct says to go up and around. I'm wondering if that's what's happening, but I, I can't, for the life of me, and I've studied a lot of biomechanics and, and technique over the years, I can't imagine why that type of lasso finish would help his swing. Like, I don't believe it's helping him get more RPM. I don't believe it's helping him get more racket speed. Most analysts, they, most observers argue that it's just a stylistic thing, like it's his personal thing, he feels comfortable doing it. And I want to know if that, is that really true or is there some technical benefit? Is there a subtle increase in RPM or racket speed that he's able to, to do with that lasso style? Because he could easily just take that extension and, and finish like he normally does to the side of his shoulder. He likes to lock in that side of the shoulder finish. He taps the side of his shoulder a lot. That's his normal typical swing it's not to the ear and it's certainly not it certainly doesn't catch it like teams practice forehand practice court forehand just just ridiculous guys that's just i believe that that's because teams teams it's his dad or or his dad's real technical and really into the fundamentals i really would like to know who forced him who forces him to do that because somebody's obviously forced team to do that Somebody's forced team to catch that thing really high, and it, it looks so contrived. It just looks so contrived when he's doing it, like someone made him do it. Like I think it was his dad. His daddy made him do it. I think his dad made him do it. And it just looks forced and mechanical because when he actually plays, team, like he doesn't do any of that. He, he doesn't keep it. So what, what's the point? And I know that Tony Nadal loves Team Sport and he loves how he does it. You know, I've taken the online courses with Tony and Tony says, oh, I really love Team. I love in practice how he catches the racket so high and he holds it. What Team does that's, that's really good is he holds it. He holds his finish really well. So he doesn't rush. He's not abrupt with his swing. He has a very nice rhythm to his swing. Anyway, I've got a lot to say on the forehand tonight, guys. I'm trying to... I'm just going to speak faster and faster so I can get more ideas off to you guys. Let me answer a few questions first, and then I'll get back to the reverse. You guys find that interesting? The reverse, the, the Rafa reverse, the team, re, the team forehand. Now team's reversing just like Rafa. This is why it's interesting. Okay, I'll just make a quick point. So Rafa was doing this lasso-style reverse where he's extending and reversing, which is different than a, a buggy whip where you're late and you're just coming up and finishing with a hook. A hook or buggy whip. Jeff Salzenstein likes to call it the buggy whip. Traditionally, it's been called the buggy whip. I like to call it the hook. Like you just hook it up. And you finish with your forearm basically resting on top of your head. It's a hook finish. So that one, we all know that one helps you get more tops than when you're late. Or coaches know that. People in tennis, players. You know, when you're late, you hook it. You buggy whip to try to create more spin. You can get... 
uh, a spin in height, you can get spin in short angle, and it helps you save a foreign that, that might, might fly out, or you might lose control of it, and you're able to whip up the back of the ball and graze the ball and control it when you're late or when you're on the run, and you can use that hook or abbreviated buggy whip on low balls too when, you're, when you have low balls that you want to attack. So th th that's really common. But what Rafa does, he does the lasso. And he's in pretty good position, but he still goes, he, and, he, and he extends. You can see it on slow motion. He extends through and up. So he could easily just turn it over and windshield wipe and follow through to the side of the shoulder. But for some reason, his instinct says to go up and back around. So it's very weird. It's a very weird place to take the follow through. And I just want to know why, why he's doing it. And now team's doing it. So when Rafa first started doing this, all the analysts and commentators and technical observers said, well, it's just, you know, he does it a little bit too much. You hear it all the time. People say, okay, this is what Rafa does on the reverse. A lot of times people conflate his, his hook with his, re, with his lasso. And I think you've you got to understand, if you're interested in building technique or teaching kids, you, you want to explain to them the difference between a lasso for him and a hook or a buggy whip for him, because there is a significant distance, difference. The lasso has extension, and, and the hook or buggy whip typically comes straight up. You know? So there's a significant difference between the lasso and the buggy whip or hook. And then there's some different variations of the hand and wrist that are happening with the lasso and with the, the buggy whip that are more, I guess, lower order variations on the reverse. And I find those interesting too. I think those are more based on the ROM, the range of motion of the, of the player's arm and shoulder and maybe personal preference, personal feeling and flexibility, muscular flexibility. So it's interesting for me, I, I guess I'm getting into the weeds a little bit. I see Jeremy Malfay's on. It's probably very interesting to him. He's a technical guru like me. He loves technique. But, you know, getting into those, uh, getting a little bit into the nitty gritty of the different types of reverses and flares that you see. Anyway, so Rafa. Everyone said, okay, this is like a stylistic thing. Like it just feels good to him, so he does it. Okay. And it's been like that for a while, but now you see more and more players adopting that. You see team, next-gen superstar, doing that. What does it mean? Like, what it, it's a mystery to me, and I want to solve it. I want to understand it. I've, I've been throwing it back and forth in my brain all, you know, for, for weeks now. A team, team, once I saw a team doing it, almost identical to Rafa, like a Rafa mimic with the lasso, I said, if team's doing it now everyone's going to start doing it. You know, Novak does. Novak does it a little bit, but not, not to the extent that team, uh, that I, uh, that I, I saw a team in the a ATP finals. I think it was ATP finals. He played Medvedev, and he was doing it a lot, just like Rafa. Very interesting technical, stylistic trend to, look, to watch for, because I think once you see a few players start to do it, it starts to become a big, uh, common, common phenomenon on tour. And I want to know if it's really, really just a stylistic thing or if players are feeling they're getting more juice or more spin out of that. How, does, how is it helping players? Because they're extending and they could easily turn it over and follow through windshield wiper or come, come to the side of the shoulder, but they choose to go up and around. Very odd to me, very strange. Also, just, you know, I have this theory that the typical... The typical inversion that you see on the finish is because the racket is a weight, you know, it's 9 or 10 or 11 ounces or, or whatever it is, and it's more efficient to let the weight hang and drift lower, and that's one of the indicators I like to see in young children. I like to see them holding the racket very loosely so that the weight can drift at the end of the swing. During the follow-through, I like to see the racket head inverted in relationship to the hand, so inverted finish, and I like to see this nice drifting action where the racket, sometimes the racket will drift down and then it'll drift up. That's okay, but essentially I like to see that the, the hand is very, the wrist and the, the arm is very loose so that the racket can hang at the end. And so oftentimes the racket will invert. It, you'll see it, the tip lower than the hand. 
And in stiff traditional forehands, old school forehands, you usually see uh, more of a firmness and rigidity in the arm and you see that the racket is held taut and it's held tightly high. And I think that's a big mistake. It creates a lot of tension. It, it promotes tension in the swing and it's an indicator of too much tension in the swing. And so that is a huge part of my method for building the forehand and little ones is getting that drift, that inversion, and that fluidity, the looseness in the arm. So this lasso phenomenon, it, it doesn't compute for me. It's, it's messing with my theory a little bit. And I'll, I'll be perfectly open and admit it because if the racket is a weight, then why would you want to raise that weight higher and, and lift it up higher above your head, higher than an even traditional finish, you know, to the ear or the neck, and then whip it around your shoulder? Like, like why would you want to put that extra stress on your arm, or your shoulder? Why would you want to lift the weight higher? And, and why isn't that promoting tension? Because it doesn't look tense. It looks very relaxed. So guys, help me out here. Let's talk about it. Anyone got any ideas out there? Come on. This is something I've been mulling over. Help me with this. You know, there's a lot of bigger issues in the world, probably. You know, we got a lot going on in the world right now that's a lot more important. I was working on the ambulance this week, helping folks. I'm an ambulance driver, an EMT, volunteer, part-time, when I'm not coaching. So, like, that's important work. But this is just... For you technical nerds out there and for you gearheads and you know, people who are really into, into how the strokes are, are the nuts and bolts of a stroke, uh, particularly the forehand, th this, is the, this is one of those areas that interests me. You know, Thanks for the thumbs up on that. Okay, a lot of people tuning in tonight. I see some, many of my old friends and a lot of big names in the tennis industry here. I see some comments or possibly questions. Let's see. Gordon Paul says he can play the devil's advocate. All right, go ahead, Gordon. Gordon is a, a friend of mine who's a very good coach in New Jersey. Gordon, if you have a devil's advocate argument, go ahead. Throw it out here. and I'll try to argue with you, and it'll be make for a good debate. Gordon says, Macy says, close face on the backhand, different from years ago. Close the face down. He's teaching the backhand with the racket face down, kind of like Rafa does. That's interesting. Is that true? That's cool, man. Maybe, maybe the backhand should change like that. That's, that's not a bad idea. I'm looking for new changes to the backhand. But this show is about the forehand and the modern evolution of the forehand. How can we teach the forehand from the 1960s or even before the 1960s? Like back to the very beginning times with the white pants and the sweaters and, you know, where no black people could play and in the clubs. You know, how, how can we teach that forehand and justify it now in 2020? It's almost 2020. How can we teach that forehand to little kids and justify it? And we justify it by saying it's fundamental. It's, it's, those are the fundamentals. We've got to teach the basics first. You know, what a crock. This is, this is coaches in framed. Coaches in framed in, and, and they're, they're, they're in framed in their habits. And, and they just can't extract themselves from the, however they were taught or however they were taught to teach and look with clear eyes on what is happening on the professional tour. What is happening with next-gen players? What is the trend? The trend is your friend, as they say in the stock market, as they say on Wall Street. You, these, so many coaches around the world are not opening their eyes and looking with clear vision at what is happening at the highest level of tennis with the forehand over the past 30 or 40 years, the arc of the last 30, 40, even 50 years, if you, if you can step back and look at the historical trend of the forehand, you will start to see a clear evolution and you can start to ride that wave of that modern technical wave and you can start teaching children in a better way. And that's my argument. 
I've been making this case for a while now. I don't know how much headway I'm getting. I do get some. I definitely have some fans now. I have some followers teaching this to their students back home. A lot of parents. I have a, a crew of coaches who are following my method. We're starting to get into it. So I guess that's kind of exciting. It's definitely flattering. But whatever. I, I don't know. I don't know how long it's going to take for people to realize where the game's going, but usually it's usually coaches are way late to catching the wave. You know, I'm trying to be on the wave, riding it, surfing it, instead of just being slammed by it and then realizing my realizing the mistakes that 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 I made. Take a step back. Look at what's happened over the years. Look, start in the 60s. Start, start, start in the 1920s and work your way up to the modern game. What, try to look up old videos online and, and start to see decade, decade by decade what's happening to the forens of the top players. And you will see a clear trend. And that's what I think we should, the way it's evolved, we should teach that to the little ones now. The, w- the way you see it in, the next, in most next-gen players, in most top juniors in the world, the way you see the foreign is how we should teach it to little kids at all levels. Beginners, intermediates, all of the young kids. Uh, advanced players usually already have it. But I don't care what the level. Adults, seniors, yeah, even seniors, everyone, I'm saying... A, just a completely new model of how you, you teach it. You just, the forehand, you teach the way the next gen guys are doing it. Sorry for that, guys. You teach it the way that the next gen guys are doing it, and you do it in a safe way with some modifications depending on the cohort, the, the, the group that you're working with, or the individual that you're working with. So maybe with seniors, it's not quite as violent, you know, but it, but it's fluid, and they use their their hips and bodies efficiently. They come off the ground a little bit. They get a nice whippy swing within what they're capable of, and they have a nice inverted drifting finish. And you know that will help a senior get better topspin. That'll help a senior prevent injury because their arm is not tight. And, uh, and they're not swinging in a rigid way. They're not locked. They're not blocked. You know, so I really feel that this is the model that we should use for everyone. And that the fundamentals argument, the, the basics argument, the teach old school and then, and then uh, you know, for the advanced, for the advanced uh, players, they can learn a new motor program. They can learn the new school stuff. I think that bifurcation, that... That split is wrong. I basically think it's it's totally wrong, and it it exists just to justify teaching the way we've we've taught it for so long. That that it justifies a, a habit, you know. And I don't know how long it will take. Probably take decades before people start really buying into this. But I'm just gonna start. I've already started arguing for this and. And I think I'm getting more and more people who are converting to my approach, to my method, which is cool. I will try to get to some of these comments, guys. Gordon Paul says, Jim Kane says, Pat the Dog on the forehand has been a gold mine for Macy. Yeah, Macy's made Pat the Dog famous. Macy teaches a lot the Federer forehand, which is pretty good. I don't know if... If he's the best model for the future uh, next gen type forehand, because uh, just because of his grip structure and and he's pretty classic in practice. There's another guy like Team who's who's got sort of a practice forehand that is an illusion. He doesn't actually swing like that when he plays. When he starts to play and accelerate, it the racket drops more because he's looser and he's whipping faster, and the the, rack, the finish gets lower and lower. And and Fed is another guy who uses a lot of reverse finishes. I don't. You have to be an astute observer, but you know he he finishes when he's late. He buggy whips and hooks a lot. He even has a forward and lasso finish that he uses quite frequently. Not as much as Nadal, but 
you see a lot of guys now doing it, and that's why it's a fascinating trend. You know, the, the, the extension with the lasso is a fascinating trend. What's it doing? Is it just a personal preference? Is it adding something? Is it adding a little RPM? Is it adding a little more pace? Or is it just something that feels comfortable? Why would you want to lift the weight higher and up around your head? You, you would think that would not be comfortable. I tried it. It feels pretty good. I mean, it feels cool. Like... It feels kind of like a ninja swing, and maybe that's why they like it. Maybe it's just a feeling thing, or is it something that's biomechanically advan- an, an advantage for these guys? That they're all—it's you see it all the time now. It's happening. But why do you see these players with a uh, catching high traditional practice swing, and then they just discard it when they start to play and swing fast? Is that is driving me crazy as well? It's bananas because then you get these morons who who want to argue for the old style way. They want to argue for the fundamentals, quote unquote. And so the, the, the video Roger or team practicing and they're doing this very old school type finish and swing and they'll say, see, Roger does it. Dominic does it. We need to teach the fundamentals like this to all the kids. You know, Salzenstein talks about that. Salzenstein is all, all about the catch high finish. I think he's Way off on that. It's great. Way off. And Salzen seems smart too, and I don't agree with that at all. You know, I think he's way off on that. He's, he's always always talking about the catch, and you got to catch, and it's going to make you forehand better. I, I'm not buying that at all. You know, it's wrong. You should you should teach the inversion, the drift, the the fluidity, the elasticity. The lower finishes, those are what get you that the the whip and the top spin and 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 they they liberate your arm, you know, much more than the high catch. The high catch finish often promotes rigidity. It promotes stiffness. Not always because it's possible to stay loose and swing up. Medvedev does a pretty good job with that. He's very loose in his arm, but you can swing up higher and still be relatively fluid, but most people, especially as you get into the less talented people, they're tight, man. When you ask them to finish high, they're tight, tight, tight. That's why I don't agree with Salzenstein at all on that. All right. Talked about Pat the Dog. We can't talk about the forehand without mentioning Pat the Dog. All right. Let's see. Gordon Paul says, catching the racket in the warm-up to find the spacing... Yeah, this is the argument. This is it. This is the, the devil's advocate argument. Team, you know, he does it to find, help create the spacing. Oh, really? You have to catch the racket up high to figure out your spacing? Just crazy. Crazy. What finds your spacing is your eyes. They are, is, are your eyes and feet. Sometimes, you know, people say the left hand can help you with the spacing. You know, when you put the left hand across, it helps a little with the spacing. That almost never works, by the way. For for most normal people, like when that doesn't help the spacing. What helps is a lot of drilling, a lot of reinforcement from the coach, the eyes and the feet. People ask me, I get that email a lot. I get a lot of email now from parents everywhere. People send me their videos from all over the place. I got videos from Belgium this week. I got videos from India this week. Had an uh, interesting little girl from Belgium. Dad sent me all the videos. Or dad or the mom. Because she's joining the Federation program. But she looks pretty good. I, I sent back a few candid comments. I don't, I don't think the mom or dad like what I said. I'm sorry. But I try to call it the way it is, you know. I try to be blunt with parents. I said, you know, she's looking pretty pretty uh traditional there with her technique and we talk about that a little bit later in the mailbox segment of the program mailbox it's coming later got a got a few questions on on a foreign technique few videos from parents and maybe uh we'll answer the question about whether your kid should play green or yellow dot or green dot or yellow that was a big question that i had this week from a uh, mom one uh, of a student that I coach uh, in the summer, actually. But green or yellow? Uh, ooh, that'll be a good mailbox question. Uh, Gordon says in the warm up, catching the racket can help create spacing. Jim Kane says, 
I don't know about that spacing idea. Jim Kane says, it, se- it sounds like a myth to me. I-, I could be wrong. It sounds like a total, so- sounds like a lot of shuck and jive, you know. At Peter Burwash Clinic 30 years ago, the pro told us non-racket hand like a computer chip. Wait, what does that mean, Jim? What does that mean? The non-racket hand like a computer chip. I don't understand what that means. Can you explain? Tell me what it means. Jim says, I love, love your parabolic forehand. Want to hear you talk about the non-hitting hand on that beautiful next-gen forehand you teach. Thanks, I am with you. Okay, so Jim Kane is, you know, he came to one of my workshops. He's a good dude. He coaches in New England. And he heard me talking about the parabolic forehand. And his ears, like, perked up. And he was like, wait, what's this? What are you, what are you saying? And I, and I just sort of explained to him sort of what I'm explaining to you guys now on the show. And he's very, he was very interested, you know. And Jim's a smart guy. And, and he's, been, he's been getting into my, my method a little bit. Good for you, Jim. Outside the box thinker. Forward thinker on the cutting edge. Thinking ahead. So Jim says, okay, the way Burwash is teaching the forehand... I know that we teach that style to all the little kids. We teach the Vic Braden style to all the little kids because it's the fundamentals. Now you see Steve Smith teaching the great bass. You know, you guys know what I'm talking about. I'm going to get a lot of hate from the Steve Smith fans. But, you know, Steve Smith is a very accomplished coach teaching the Vic Braden method. Why are we teaching a method from the 19-whatever, 70s and 80s, why are we teaching that to young kids? It's almost 2,020 people. When are coaches going to wake up? Parents, wake up. Look on the, turn on the TV. If you even have a TV, turn on social media. Turn on, go online and look at videos. We have YouTube now. Go look at the best players, juniors, Orange Bowl winners, you know, uh, grand junior grand slam champions, or, or, or don't even look at one player. Look look at a cohort. Look at a, a group, a group of 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 the top hundred ITF juniors. Look at their forehands. Look at the way they look. Are they fluid? Are they whippy? Are they elastic? Are they using lots of semi open open stances? Are they are they reversing? Are they lassoing are they hooking are they drifting on the finish are they finishing lower than the ear and neck are they catching like team most of them come on there's no way there's no way most of those kids are catching the racket like team his forehand is so contrived his practice forehand is so contrived do their forehands look like medvedev no way no way the the best juniors in the world's forehand look like medvedev do they look like roger Maybe a few, you know. Roger's got a lot of variation to his swing. He's kind of a hybrid. He's kind of... Roger is basically like the forehand. He has something for everyone. He's got the old and the new. He's just... He's the magic man. And he's somehow hybridized the forehand. He he's, has his foot in the time machine to go to the future. And he's still in the past or the present or whatever. Whatever the metaphor is. He, he's doing both deals. So I, I don't like studying Rogers foreign that, that much because you see it everywhere. It's everywhere. I mean, I probably studied it already, you know, ad nauseum because it, everyone studies Rogers foreign. But I like to look at some of the young guns coming up, the next gen. I like to watch all the internationally ranked juniors coming up. You know, there you can start to see. But uh, you want to analyze the what the preponderance of evidence is, which means not just one or two players. I see that mistake that coaches make a lot. Well, they say, well, well, team catches or, or Medvedev follows through around his neck. Okay. Yeah. But if 98 out of the hundred players or, or 90% of the top juniors coming up, the next wave of juniors is not swinging like that. I mean, what is the actual trend? Honestly, you got to look at the trend. The trend is your friend. And coaches just are just very myopic. They, they have their blinders on. They, they, like I said, they're inframed by their habits. They're stuck in this tennis world where we got to teach the fundamentals. Have you seen what, what Steve Smith teaches 
the Vic, the Vic Braden style, still teaching the same style, like decades and decades later. It's these are the people, the traditionalists who never change. They're in every industry. Just thought of this. It's it's in every industry. It's in medicine. It's in law. It's in business. There are people who refuse to evolve. There are people who are, they're comforted by tradition. They're comforted by a, a belief system that says that things don't change. That things are always, that, that there is universal truth. That there is a pristine technique that will always be right and that is the fundamentals, you know, quote unquote, the fundamentals, Steve Smith's fundamentals, Vic Braden's fundamentals, they're timeless truths. In every industry you have these people and, and they always get eventually swept away or taken over by the, by the others in the industry who are looking forward and evolving. Always this happens. This is, this is the lesson of history that people are not learning in tennis. And so, yeah, you have the, the, the people that cling to timeless truth. you got to take the racket back. you got to step in. you got to be firm with your wrist. you got to swing from low to high. you got to follow through to the ear. Blah, 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 blah. And it's a timeless truth that never changes. doesn't matter what's happening on the pro tour. doesn't matter that the whole world, in regards to the forehand, the whole world vis-a-vis -vis the forehand has dramatically changed in the last 30 or 40 years even doesn't matter there's timeless truth to the foreign technique and we got to start all the kids that way we cling to it like a religion we're just blind blind you know by the need to have the security of a timeless truth this is wrong people it's wrong it's misguided i'm not saying it's intentional these people are just they're, they're not they're not seeing the trend for what's really happening they're not seeing the evolution of technique the way it's transpiring right in front of their eyes they're blinded to it okay let's continue with a few more comments jim kane says gordon paul's got a lot of a lot of thoughts tonight good job guys thanks for sharing burwash wanted to emphasize that the non-hitting hand is important one gent I was helping and others let their hand go straight to the side while hitting hand racket is making contact. You must see that common problem with rec players. Okay, so let's, I'll help you out here, Jim, with some thoughts about the non-hitting hand. The non-hitting hand should be on the racket typically very long into the turn. So that's really important. That's something you see on the modern forehand that's different than you typically see on the old school forehands. And I think the left hand is like a computer chip. The <laughs> Burwash said it's like a computer chip. I guess it's helping with the rhythm and timing of the swing. It's not a bad metaphor, I'll take it. But I don't think it should catch the racket man. The left hand does its job and then it swings out of the way. It helps the body rotate. That's what it does really well. It goes usually straight and then it bends and comes out kind of like you're trying to elbow someone behind you it and it helps to rotate the torso and increase racket head speed it can help a little bit with the balance obviously it's the offhand but i don't think it needs to be